Welcome back to America's Commercial Real Estate Show. I'm Michael Bull. Thank you for being with us. This segment is brought to you by my company, Bull Realty. For custom asset and occupancy solutions, visit bullrealty.com or give me a call. Well, today we're talking about retail, retail business, retail real estate. Please welcome my next guest, Nick Garcia. He's Director of Leasing with Heinz, and he's here in Studio One. Nick, thanks for being with us. I'm glad to be here again, Michael. Happy New Year. Thank you. Well, Nick, you know, one thing that I think a lot of people look at is in retail, the holiday season really means a lot, right? It I know does. a yes. lot of retailers do a, a lot, a big, large bulk of their sales. So who were the winners and losers in, uh, in, in it's this past holiday season? And uh, what's that translate for, for those types of businesses moving forward? Sure. I, I think a lot of the numbers are still starting to trickle in, but a lot, mm -hmm. of, the re a lot of the different retailers are giving guidance about where they ended up. Uh, Costco, Walmart had really, really big you know, fourth quarters and holiday season. Uh, Target uh, did as well. You know, Amazon, everybody likes to kind of think about them as a online, but they're morphing into a retailer. And I think the definition of what retail really means whether it's online or in a store is changing. So um, I think you've got to definitely got to include them in that group. Some of the other discounters, people like TJ Maxx, uh, some of your, what do you call it, dollar store chains did very, very well over that time. Believe it or not, Macy's. Uh, I believe their comps are up about 3% versus last year. Uh, nice to see the, you know, the traditional department store kind of making a, uh, uh, come back. Is it solving all their issues and problems? No, but um, I think they're definitely moving in the right direction. Uh, as far as the people that you know, kind of missed out uh, this holiday season, like uh, Pier One had a terrible fourth quarter. They had to you know, really deeply discount a lot of their merchandise. Mm -hmm. uh, Sears, um, that's been an ongoing struggle and story for several several years. And it looks like they're about to get one more you know, kind of lifeline uh, before they you know, kind of fall apart completely. Um, they did not have a great, great you know, fourth uh, quarter and holiday season. And believe it or not, somebody like a Starbucks. Um, which bet heavily on merchandise this fourth quarter to push mugs and you know makers and things like that out the door. They were really disappointed mm -hmm. with how that worked out as well. But um, uh, overall, you know, you've got the economy doing very, very well. So I think on I think based on taste trends, whether you're on merchandise or not, I think you'll see a lot of people kind of in one bag or the other. We met or exceeded expectations or we just kind of fell short of those expectations. Yeah. Well, Nick, where are people shopping? I went to a, a mixed-use development and it was very vibrant. Mm -hmm. I went to to a mall. Uh, well, actually, I went near it. I didn't, it was, the parking lot was packed, so mm -hmm. I, I didn't really go in. But it was it seemed very vibrant. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, where are people doing their shopping today? I, I, th I think it depends on what the purpose of your trip really, really is. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're seeing nationally, you're starting to see, Michael, like a stratification of um, mall product type. Mm -hmm. um, the bigger mall REITs, Simon, GGP, Mace Rich, Westfield, they've all kind of shed their C and lower type of projects and they're focusing on you know B and better type of properties. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and even in the mall sector, you've got malls that kind of have a broad general appeal or you've got malls that have a very narrow appeal as far as the merchandise goes. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I do think there's a natural sort of appeal though of the mixed use uh, open air, you know, lifestyle center projects. It kind of reminds people of what, you know, Main Street USA really used to be. And um, I just think being outside, you know, particularly here in the Southeast, as long as it's not raining, people really enjoy that open air walkable, you know, quasi-urban atmosphere is a place to go and just spend time. I don't even think it's really even about shopping sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's about that third place yeah. Yeah. where people just want to kind of hang out, have a cup of coffee, and then just kind of, you know, window shop and browse a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you totally. In fact, I did that uh, one weekend in December. It was a pretty day, and I went mm -hmm. to a mixed-use development. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know what, I'll go and uh, have a bite to eat. I'll have a drink, and you, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and then I'll think about walking around and, and think about gifts for for certain people so true I, I did that and you know, I know a lot of people around the country uh, are familiar with Atlantic Station where you do the leasing and it's a uh, it's a very large uh, mixed-use development uh, in a very midtown area of, of Atlanta um, and it's went through some changes over the years mm -hmm. right 
Uh, how is it? How is it doing now? How are mixed use tenants, especially in retail, doing? What, what's the vibe there? Uh, bigger picture, I think the generation of you know stores that are starting to grow and kind of spread their wings and open stores, mm -hmm. they're designing for urban streets. They're designing for mixed use projects. Mm -hmm. They are not designing their stores. They're not targeting their stores anyways for single purpose traditional retail malls. Mm -hmm. So I think products that are not going to be diversifying themselves um, with offices, with hotels, with fitness, other non-true retail sort of places mm -hmm. are going to be at a little bit of a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to Atlantic Station though, um, 2018 was just a huge, huge year for us. Mm -hmm. um, we're now in our third year of ownership of that project and um, there's over a half a billion dollars of brand new leasing development taking place wow. there. We broke ground um, on our uh, Central Park redevelopment, which is going to include three local chef-driven restaurants, and it's going to be about a $20 million rehab to the physical part of it, just to make that you know nice creature comfort sort of place where people want to come and hang out in. Uh, we opened up our flagship 40,000 square foot H&M. We started construction on two additional flagship retailers that will be opening up in 2019. Um, and plans have been made in our different stages of approval for three brand new hotels, totaling nearly 400 rooms that will be open by the end of 2020. Uh, Amley, the national multifamily development company, they're going to break ground in the spring on a new 360 unit uh, luxury residential complex that's going to have 25,000 square feet of new shop on the base level of it, right in the heart of the project. So. Um, in a lot of ways, if anybody knows the west side of Atlanta, our project Atlantic Station, I think really jump-started all of the development that's happening on the west side. Mm -hmm. And I would argue with anybody that you wouldn't see as rapid of a transformation there without the 17th Street Bridge being extended over because yeah. it made a very fast east-west connection. Yeah. Um, so things are going very, very well. There's going to be a lot of barricades and a lot of dust flying mm -hmm. uh, with us this year, but um, in the fourth quarter. Um, the project's really evolving to a point that I think the original developers always wanted it to, yeah. and it was truly, truly ahead of its time. Let me ask you, you mentioned a couple of new restaurants mm -hmm. opening up, and, and not just your center, but when you look at shopping centers, malls, mm -hmm. uh, mixed-use developments uh, around the U.S., mm -hmm. Can you have too many restaurants? <laughs> <laughs> that, that doesn't seem to be a, a really uh, going against a the trend these days. Yeah. I, I think a great collection of restaurants, Michael, five, mm -hmm. six, seven of them, can almost act as like a de facto anchor yeah. to, to a project the way a department yeah. store used to. Um, the one trend I think that is here, it's not a fad anymore, people love dining out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be with us uh, for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I think you see happening out there is uh, the growth of food halls. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't believe there's a national consensus yet about the best model to run those on. And I also don't believe that they're a magic bullet. But um, food halls seem to be, uh, um, they're almost like the co-working spaces for the food community. Mm -hmm. You get uh, people in there that want to try their wares with one particular menu item. You get a couple anchor spots within there as well too that drive that mm -hmm. consistent traffic. Um, but um, I, I, I still think that those are, that's an evolving sort of feature. And I still think there's a lot of issues out there with the operation of them. So it seems like everybody's kind of proposing one, but I don't think all of them are going to be built. Yeah. Well, what do you foresee for 2019 and into 2020 and retail? How do you think it's going to perform, and, and what are some of the trends you see forming? Um, retail is the subject of a lot of uh, headlines these days, mm -hmm. and um, we've talked before about the retail apocalypse, and I, I don't believe that it's as bad as you know the media really makes it out to be. Mm -hmm. I think old and tired retail is failing at a rate faster than it ever has, um, and um, uh, I, I think some of the positive trends that you see out there, though, I, I think what's happened the last four or five years where a lot of these retailers are on big you know, growth, open up 25, 30 stores a year, and they're probably opening up 10 stores a year. Mm -hmm. But they're putting a lot of dollars into their back of house mm -hmm. where they want the omni-channel to converge with the physical stores. Um, so, again, I mentioned it earlier, a sale is a sale, mm -hmm. whether it's in the store, whether it's online, whether mm -hmm. it's on your phone. So having that sort of seamless transition, I, I, I think customers are becoming, they almost need it these days, and they're going to push aside anybody who's not doing that. I think buy online, pick up in store is uh, going to uh, be a great way for retailers to kind of satisfy that you know, itch of the millennials to get that instant gratification. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a way to drive people to the stores as well, uh, too. Um, uh, I think the trend you're seeing of pure play online opening up stores is going to continue. I read a study, a report a few weeks ago about how um, 
uh, what do you call traditional online retailers are going to be opening up m almost a thousand stores in the next five or six years. So um, they've got reams of data and they know where their customer is and they know what they like. So mm -hmm. that's going to be an interesting trend playing out there as well too. And I, I think the biggest battle that's shaping up for 19, 20, even a little bit beyond is Amazon versus Walmart. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what each of them is and each of them what they're not. Amazon has got the great online presence and with their acquisition of Whole Foods, their Amazon Go stores or other foray into uh, what we call brick and mortar retail, they're getting to the point where you know Walmart has got all those physical stores and is bolstering their back of house. So I, I think the up and coming battle in retail in the years ahead is really going to be Amazon versus Walmart and um, they're differing yet similar models of how to meet the customer needs. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you about how you guys are looking at percentage rent these days. So at, at your mixed-use development Atlantic station, do you have some tenants that, that have some percentage rent clauses? Um, every one of them has a percentage rent clause, okay. yes. So, so what's happening today on percentage rent on online sales and online orders picks up in stores, mm -hmm. online orders that maybe the store delivers mm -hmm. from the store? How do you handle that? Um, in general, percentage rent has evolved the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and it's gone from a... Uh, it's gone away from a natural sort of break point, take the net rent, divide it by five, six, seven percent, and there's your threshold. I, I think more and more retailers are now embracing an artificial break point mm -hmm. um, and wanting to share with a landlord because deals have become tougher. Mm -hmm. With fewer stores opening, the landlords um, are having to put more capital into deals. So we want to recapture some of that investment sooner. Mm -hmm. But with respect to the online play, that, that is still an evolving challenge. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest challenges we see right now is um, re, uh, stores that take back like a lot of merchandise and returns. Mm -hmm. That normally counts against your gross sales threshold. Mm -hmm. So particularly somebody say like an H&M, 40,000 square foot store, they're getting more you know, returns probably than any of the other stores just due to its size. Yeah. Um, so somebody from Cincinnati you know, happens to be in town and has a package from H&M uh, that they've been with them and they just happen to see the store and they want to mm -hmm. go return it. Well, why should that count against our mm -hmm. sales threshold and, and the chance for us to get percentage rent? So we've, we've been successful in limiting the amount of returns, mm -hmm. but as far as quantifying where somebody buys online and what that you know, theoretical radius is, should we count any mm -hmm. online sale within a mile, two mile, a half a mile? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's still an ongoing sort of argument. Yeah, well, it's and, there. and it's certainly interesting because, you know, they, as an online retailer, you want that store presence. Right. Uh, it helps you. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you might order online and then pick it up in the store. Correct, yes. Right, mm -hmm. and, then, and then some of these stores, like, you know, you mentioned uh, Whole Foods and Amazon, mm -hmm. some of these stores become uh, delivery. Uh, you know, for same day delivery to, to people's homes. So, which I got to tell you, my wife and I love uh, yeah. using Instacart, and then yeah. even simple things uh, on Amazon for you know, paper towels or dishwasher mm -hmm. detergent or yeah. things that just take up space in the car or the cart to have those delivered right to your front step. Yeah. is incredibly convenient. Yeah, yeah. Well, it certainly is. Well, Nick, thanks for joining us. Great information as usual. Thank you very much. I appreciate being here. All right. Well, thank you. We're going to have more on retail and retail real estate. So stay with us. I'm Michael Bull. This is America's Commercial Real Estate Show.